So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for registering and joining us this afternoon. Um, our goal today, I'll talk more in depth about that in a moment, but we are hoping to just provide uh, an overview of our state's instructional programming. So you'll learn much more about this and be pros by the end, I promise. But we are going to focus on uh, pre-K for me, K for me, and first grade for me. Um, so a quick peek into our early learning team. There's many more of us that exist on our team than is listed here. However, these um, are the folks that really spend um, the most time working within the programs. Um, the other members of our team are supporting folks in the field that are using maybe these instructional programs or something else. Um, so you'll see on our website that we have a number of um, individuals who work on the early learning team. But I'm going to pause and I'll just introduce myself real quick. My name is Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist on our team. Um, and then I also have with me Leanne and Marcy. So Leanne, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure thing. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to have you all here. We're looking forward to spending some time with you. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the director of um, early learning in the Department of Education. And I get to work with a fabulous team of folks um, around this particular project um, that we're going to be sharing today. And Marcy, I know you're here. So did you want to introduce yourself real quick? I am. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Marcy Wickham. I'm the public pre-K consultant here on the early learning team. Um, my main role is to work with educators and administrators in our public pre-K programs and partnership classrooms across the state. Um, and any support and guidance, resources, anything that everybody needs. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then we also have listed on the screen D Sosier. Uh, D is the Inclusive Literacy Specialist and Dyslexic Lexia Coordinator. Um, and she works on the Office of um, Special Education and Inclusive Education. So I don't believe D is joining us today, but do know that she has been an active participant in these instructional programs, the development of them, the training and PLCs of them. Um, so we certainly didn't want to leave her off. So some more specific goals for today uh, include the following. We, we're definitely going to provide just a brief history of our work to date as it relates to pre-K for me, K for me, and first grade for me. Uh, we're going to take some time to examine the components of these whole child interdisciplinary instructional programs as well as explore resources that are related to the programs and describe the opportunities for ongoing professional learning and support um, in the summer as well as throughout the school year. So with those things said, I'm going to pass it over to Leanne and she's going to talk to us about some of the history. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So um, all of the work that we have done uh, related to the instructional programs that we're going to be sharing with you this afternoon got its start um, in Maine anyway, back around 2018. But the work had begun long before that. And one of the things that we always make a point of um, really giving some kudos to is the Boston Public Schools, because they are really the foundation of the programs that we are working on um, sharing with schools here in our state. Boston started their work back in about 2005. Um, they began this work because they had recently moved to providing public pre-K across their schools in Boston. And they had um, originally adopted the OWL um, curriculum at that time. And the OWL curriculum, um, the original version of it stopped being produced after a certain point. And Boston really liked the design of it and wanted to keep it in their programming. Um, and so they worked with the publishers of OWL to allow them to take it, adapt it, um, and kind of create what they now refer to um, as their focus on. And in Boston, it's interesting, they don't um, call it pre-K and K, they call pre-K K1 and kindergarten K2. So originally it was called focus on K1. But one of the things that they began to notice as they were implementing this design that they had um, based upon the, the original OWL curriculum was that 
um, they wanted to ensure better alignment into their kindergarten and then their first and their second grade classrooms across their city. And so they took it upon themselves to start designing out um, programs that were appropriate for students at those particular grade levels. And one of the things that they've always done is um, share those programs as open source resources and are very welcoming to schools across the country that would like to learn more about their work. So for us in Maine, we um, had been working a lot on public pre-K expansion back um, around, well, starting around 2015. And um, as more and more pre-Ks were coming on board in our state, one of the things that we were hearing from them was, you know, investing in some of the commercial programs can be pretty expensive and can often be a bit of a barrier for us in terms of getting programming started. Is there any other approach that we might be able to take or other resource? So we had started really looking for something that might be um, a piece that we could offer that would make this more doable, but still very um, much evidence-based and um, in alignment with all the domains of development for young children. And we happened upon Boston's work and had the chance to go down and visit and get to know um, what had gone into it. And that led us to developing a relationship with Boston and working with one of their consultants to help us take their, at the time, pre-K program and adapt it for use in Maine. And that meant actually testing it out in some Maine pre-K classrooms, getting feedback from teachers, um, adapting pieces of it to make it more Maine specific in terms of some of the learning activities and texts that were are used in the program. Um, also in Maine, we added more pieces to it. And we were able to do all of that with some support from um, the U.S. Department of Education in a grant. Shortly after we launched Pre-K for Me as an option, we started getting requests from kindergarten classrooms um, or schools on behalf of their kindergarten classrooms to say, hey, we really like what we're seeing the impact of Pre-K for Me is. We'd like to be able to continue that design and so um, that's what led us to continue the work. And we had some grant money still left and that enabled us to get a pilot in place, continue working with Boston on their, um, with their consultant. We launched a pilot in 2019-20 with 14 kindergarten classrooms across the state. And I bet all of you can well remember what happened in <laughs> that particular school year. Um, we had to kind of suspend our pilot because of our friend, um, the pandemic. Um, but what was really interesting is that when we went um, to restart the pilot the following year, we actually had 14 more kindergartens that wanted to join us in the journey. So we added them and doubled the size of the pilot um, for that second year. Um, and gathered the input, made the um, adjustments that needed to be made, and then posted that program in August of 2021 as an open source resource. Um, this work has continued for us in Maine. Um, we were able to seek out some more resources to help support a pilot for the first grade program. We again did more enhancements to that, including adding um, science and STEM lessons that are specific um, to the first grade. The um, that particular program was just added this past year as an open source resource um, for first grades in our state. And we will be embarking in the next year on a pilot for the second grade version. So it's been a goal of ours for a while to get all the way through second grade um, and have that whole continuum available to schools in our state. Nicole, can you go back just one second to the previous slide? Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that, Leanna. <laughs> you're fine. Oh, you're fine. It's always hard when you're you're doing a great job, like anticipating. Not a problem. Just one one more back, one more back. 
it's all good. Um, you might have noticed on the right hand side of this screen is a book called Children at the Center. This is the text that um, Boston wrote with some of their original researchers and um, published to really talk about the journey of the development of this program in Boston and the impact that it has had. Um, I'll, we'll talk probably coming up in a few minutes about the research behind um, Boston's work and then some of what we've found in our pilot experiences. But we often recommend children at the center um, to schools if they're thinking about um, investing in these programs because it's a really um, great way to learn the history and really see sort of the thought process behind the design of the program. Thanks, Nicole. You can go, keep going forward. <laughs> All right. So speaking of valuations, um, a couple things that are important to make sure that folks know is that um, Boston's work has been very rigorously studied over the last um, 15 years. They did some initial research studies to track the impact that it was having on students in Boston. Uh, but then they became part of a much larger um, Institute of Education Sciences study, a longitudinal study where they were really looking at the impact um, of the programming, particularly the alignment of it from year to year and how that plays out for students that experience the program year after year after year. And um, those findings can be found at the link that we've provided and we will share the slides afterwards so that you can um, have a chance to, to take a look at um, that particular study. The um, study that's underneath it is actually um, one that was conducted by WestEd and on, this happened on behalf of our Pre-K for Me version in the state. So um, shortly after Pre-K for Me was published, one of the things that started to happen is that a number of our Head Start programs in the state were interested in potentially using it. Uh, a lot of those programs had been using OWL, but when it went out of print, they were looking for a new choice. And if you're uh, working in a Head Start program, you have to select your curriculum from a list of approved programs. And to be on that list of approved programs, you have to undergo a review that WestEd conducts. So um, we submitted Pre-K for Me on behalf of our Head Start programs in the state. WestEd reviewed it and approved that program. So um, I think that also points to the development and comprehensiveness of the program and its alignment with standards, both our own standards here in Maine, in this case, the MELDs, um, but also Head Start standards. Um, and what's interesting about it is that places Pre-K for Me actually on a national list. So while Maine Head Starts can certainly select it, um, so could other Head Starts from across the country if they chose to. In our own pilot projects, um, we assessed a variety of different pieces, some through teacher interviews, some through classroom observations, some through assessment data that we collected from schools. Um, and on the screen, we've just tried to list some of the key strengths that we um, noticed across all of the different pilots that we've conducted. So a couple things that are good to point out, um, the developmentally appropriate nature of these programs um, was captured again and again and again. All of these programs have a play-based component to them. They are very hands-on. They are also interdisciplinary, so they integrate content across themes throughout the year, and this builds from year to year to year, and we'll show you some examples of that this afternoon. We also heard a lot from our teachers about the way in which the programs support not only children's academic development, but their social and emotional learning and provide a lot of opportunity for student agency. Probably the number one thing that we hear from teachers 
whether it was in the pilots or just when we talk with schools that have since taken on the use of the program, is that second big bullet student disposition increases. Teachers frequently talk about how joyful their children are using the programs, the amount of engagement that they build, the confidence, the creativity um, that they see being available to their children. But they also talk about um, increases in a lot of academic um, aspects. In terms of what we captured in the pilots, we were looking a lot at the literacy area of development because all of these programs are very literacy and language rich. And full transparency, we could not measure everything. So we had to be a little bit more fine grain, but we definitely saw a lot of gains in literacy skills, particularly children's phonemic awareness and phonics skills vocabulary development, huge growth across the board, as well as children's comprehension, listening and speaking skills. So you might be asking yourself, why might I want to consider using one of these programs? And there are lots of reasons that we could point to. One thing we like um, folks to really think about. If you go to the center of this slide and you look at that list in the middle, these are all, um, I think, things that probably everyone, I hope, on this screen um, really believes about children's learning. And it's something that we as an early learning team deeply believe in, that young children are very capable of higher order complex thinking. They should be active participants in their learning. That you build meaningful knowledge through robust interactions and high engagement. And that instruction is impactful when teachers are really researchers in their own classrooms, when they're getting to interact with children in ways that are helping kids to um, explore, create, build that knowledge. And that's something that is really, all of those four pieces are really hallmarks of these instructional programs. They definitely um, use an interdisciplinary approach and are aligned with our state standards, whether it's the MELDs or our learning results. They most certainly have a very focused set of sequential skills and concepts. There's lots of explicit and intentional instruction that's happening. But there's also lots of room for both purposeful play, project-based experiences, effective teaching practices, and a lot of room for children's voice and agency. So those are pieces that we really like to underscore that as you start to look at the programs that you're kind of keeping those pieces in mind. Okay. I'm gonna take it over from here for the next few slides and just sort of dive in a little bit deeper. Um, a child's experience in pre-K for me, K for me and first grade for me classrooms includes many, many, many bullets. Um, we tried to sort of bring them into an amount that we could talk about today and share today, but please know that a child's day in school and under these instructional programs is really diverse and unique. Um, but on any given day in any of these grades, you'll likely find children that are learning um, to include multiple and diverse experiences with affirming and enabling texts. We'll chat about some of those, what we call core texts later on, um, but each of the instructional programs really focus on read alouds and those books that are chosen for that time of the day are really specific and really diverse and are for children um, sort of a view into these really um, rich experiences. So during the day, those are going to be affirmed th through other activities. Um, children have opportunities to direct their own activities in including play that happens um, in pre-K during centers and in kindergarten during studios. So we'll chat about what that looks like as well. 
There's collaboration with and feedback from their peers. Um, there's a lot of interaction that is encouraged throughout the day, whether that's adult to child or child to child. Um, and we really work through the trainings and through the ongoing PLCs to support educators in facilitating that. Uh, there's also authentic conversations and students have um, a lot of time every day to hear and practice new words. Um, Leanne mentioned the growth in students' vocabulary. Um, hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you'll see where that is really focused and strategic throughout the day. Um, children are supported and are working on their foundational skills um, across their whole child development, not just in math and ELA, but as a human being in that space. Uh, we're also uh, encouraging children to investigate uh, phenomena in their environment, right? So we'll give them opportunities to interact with um, new materials and new equipment that they might not have otherwise had experiences with before. There's also daily discussion of important ideas and opportunities to draw on and share their life experiences. Um, and that last bullet is a really fun and exciting one. Um, and interacting with teachers through the pilot and, and through their ongoing implementation of these programs, um, it's one that interestingly, teachers are hesitant to really grasp the importance of or grasp the how to of that particular component. But once they do it, once they take that leap, it quickly becomes one of their favorite components. And that's um, a, through storytelling and story acting. So we'll chat about that in a few more minutes too. Uh, so this is just a quick visual to sort of show how the um, units of study progress through the grades. So in our pre-K for me curriculum or instructional program, we have six units of study. And you'll see by the color coding that two of those are focused around community and what we believe young children recognize as their community. Um, two of them in the green are focused on earth science concepts. And the two in blue are focused on physical science concepts. As children age through the grades, um, we go from six units down to four units of study, but you can see how those concepts progress as uh, and build on each other as the students age. Um, so what was family and friends in pre-K becomes our community in kindergarten, which overlaps into social studies concepts. In first grade, we build upon that more through building strong communities. And then in second grade, um, students are learning how they learn in their school community. So that idea of community really begins all the way back in September of pre-K and continues all the way through um, second grade. And the same is true for the other um, units as well. So I'm just going to pause here for a few seconds so you can see this. And if there's anything that I forgot to add, Leanne, feel free to jump in. Okay. So I keep saying the word component, right? This is a component of the program. So like other curricula that exists in the world, there are certain parts that uh, are meant to be implemented. So whether that's a read aloud or whether that's a math lesson or whether that's a science lesson, et cetera. That's what I mean when I'm referring to the components. It's the parts of the program that come together to make it what it is. Um, so one of our grade one pilot teachers quoted was quoted here to say that because of the comprehensive and integrated text, science, writing, and vocabulary, students have been so much more aware, excuse me, aware of and curious about the world around them. They're motivated to research, write, create, and explore more with each topic. And if you've ever been to our pre-K for me training in the summer, one thing that I always kick us off with saying is I ask the audience, you know, what is something that our four-year-old students love the most? What do they know the most about, right? And it's, will often will get responses and we always say that the answer is themselves. They love themselves. They love their friends. They love their family. They know the world around them. So that's really what these instructional programs are building upon, right? So we're not talking about things that are too big to grasp. We're honing it in on the world around them to build these concepts and um, this, this developmental growth around. So I think that's one of the big things and what this teacher here was sort of getting at is when we bring the focus to what they know and love, um, then the, the real learning just explodes. So all three grades share some common components and then we'll break apart the uniqueness of each grade. 
So all three, like I mentioned before, really focus and center around the read aloud or in other grades, we call it the text talk. So those are the core texts that have been uh, chosen for the program um, that really hone in on the unit of study. So whether we're talking about friends and family or whether we're talking about earth science topics like shadows um, and light and shadows or the world of color, things like that, the books are dedicated and related to those topics. Um, all three grades also offer an opportunity for center time. So centers in this program is not indoor free play at all. The center's component is incredibly strategized and intentional time of the day. This is where so much of the interaction between adult and children and children to children happens. Um, this is not the time to be making photocopies or running to the bathroom or sort of checking out. This is a time for the educators in the classroom to really be with the students, interact with them with the materials and the um, activities that they're working on and build on that. All the programs also have storytelling and story acting. I mentioned earlier before, this is an opportunity for students to use their voice and use their imagination and to tell a story, whether it's true um, or fiction or nonfiction. Um, and then they can have the opportunity to act it out. This is the component that I had mentioned is a little more difficult to get going, but once it's going, the students and, and educators end up loving it. Um, they all offer an opportunity for small groups or stations. The terminology is a little bit different, but the idea of that component is very similar, as well as science and STEM. So when we start to break down by grade, you'll see that other components fall specifically to that grade. So for example, in pre-K for me, we have what we call thinking and feedback. And we also have a time of day that is called songs, wordplay, letters, and numbers. We refer to it as Swiplin. Um, and that's really in pre-K, the time for phonics um, and some more vocabulary from singing. Um, and there's some numbers and math activities thrown in there as well. Um, it, it's important to note that in pre-K for me, we do have a, our own separate math component, which I'm looking at now, I didn't put in there. Um, so if you're adopting pre-K for me, you do not need to adopt a separate math curriculum. Um, the math pieces are all embedded within pre-K. In K for me and first grade for me, they build off into other components that include some reading and foundational literacy instruction, as well as writing. Um, those looking to adopt or implement K for me and first grade for me will likely need a separate supplemental math program, as well as um, a phonics program, which I think Leanne will talk about more in just a minute. Pre-K for me also offers um, an outdoor nature-based component as well that's optional. So this is a web, <laughs> a very colorful, dynamic web. Um, and it's specific to the K for me instructional program. So what it's meant to show was that in the middle is the text, that core text that I was talking about that happens during the read aloud, which you can see webs out to read aloud. And then that read aloud, that test, text connects to all of the other components. We're building vocabulary from there. It's connected to the unit question. Our writing lessons are connected to the text. Um, our foundational literacy and shared reading, stations, strategic small groups are built from that text and the concepts within it. Um, storytelling and story acting, centers, and then our home link. So these are all sort of the chunks and pieces of K for me and how they're just interconnected um, and I have a similar one for first grade for me. One so thing I'll just, yes, whoops, please. sorry, Nicole, just interject that you might notice that that's a little bit different when you get into first grade. And this would be the same for second grade. The um, way in which the center time is um, described shifts in first grade to being studios for students as kids are getting a little older. Um, that term seems to help elevate a little bit better the kinds of things that they are engaging in and doing. Um, so that's one little difference that you'll see when you as as you shift up in the grade levels. That's exactly what I was going to say is that some of them are similar <laughs> but different different titles. <laughs> but you explained it much better. <laughs> Um, okay, and then I did just want to share quickly as well, these are sample schedules, which 
they're just screenshots from our guiding documents. When we have our summer training, we really dive much deeper into these. So for the sake of today, I'm going to go through it quickly, but please know that during training, your educators will have much more time to really dive into these and, and make it their own. Um, but in our pre-K for me, um, guiding documents, we offer sample schedules for half day and full day programs. This half day schedules for two and a half hours. We also have a three hour one and a three and a half hour half day program. But again, these times um, vary from school to school. So nothing about this is set in stone. What I will say is that the three components written in blue, intro to centers, centers, and thinking and feedback, should happen in that order. Um, and the reasons why of that really are explained again during the summer training, but those three components really build on each other every day. Um, so there's room in schedules to sort of switch around when we do Swiplin or when we do small groups or when we do um, let's find out about it, for example. But really the chunk of the student's day should accommodate center, center time and thinking and feedback. Um, and really this is just to show at a quick snapshot that it's possible <laughs> um, with, uh, with some time, with some practice, with some um, pencil and erasing, we can fit it all in. This is a similar quick snapshot for K for me, again, to show that it's possible, it's doable, right? These times are not concrete. They're really meant as an example. Again, center, center time and thinking and feedback, or excuse me, intro to center, center time and thinking and feedback is the largest chunk that happens sequentially. The other pieces will sort of ebb and flow depending on your recess time, your lunch time, um, if your children access allied arts programs, things like that. Those pieces will um, you know, look different, but the time that it takes to implement each component is explained here in the sample, again, more thoroughly during training. And um, you know, we're happy to chat about where things fit and, and how it all comes together over the course of a week and then over the course of a whole unit. And as you might guess, there's one for first grade as well. <laughs> so this sample schedule is broken down a little bit differently. Instead of showing where you might fit it in over the course of a day, it shows how much time a teacher might commit to each component. So 10 minutes um, across the week for vocabulary, or excuse me, across every day for vocabulary and language, 25 minutes approximately for the text talk or the read aloud, about 30 minutes for your phonics program, et cetera. Yeah. One thing I'll point out here, Nicole, um, yeah. and this is on us, where it says stations for 40 minutes, during that time, students are engaged in literacy stations, but there's also small group instruction happening with teachers. So um, kids would be rotating through that. And one thing that's that it, you'll notice is also a little different by first grade is that unlike pre-K and K where centers are happening every day, Studios happen three days a week, and that alternates with blocks of time for science instruction. All right, Leanne, you can stay right on. <laughs> All right. So um, one of the components that, as you've noticed, we hope by this point, that's absolutely essential in these programs is how those key core texts that are selected for each one of the units um, of instruction are um, central to everything within the program. Um, so the read aloud or text talk time of the day is one of those non-negotiable pieces. The program absolutely will not work if that piece is not being utilized because so much connects to it. Um, something else that you will notice as you start to think, to take a look at some of the text, and we're gonna show you a few um, in just a minute, is that they're really very rich texts, robust texts, texts that are begged to be read more than once, and they will be read more than once um, in the program. Sometimes you'll read them three, four times, um, but you'll be reading them in different ways and looking for different aspects. Really robust texts are selected because they go a long way to building children's vocabulary and their comprehension. 
So kids are working through and really um, using those questions of what is it that we're reading and how are we making sense of it? And teachers are helping very intentionally to build those kinds of thinking skills with their students. Um, it's not unusual for children to experience some of the texts in the beginning of the year. And in later units, they'll wanna pull those out again because they'll start making connections between texts that are used later in the year and the characters, um, the plots, the vocabulary they discovered early on. Um, which is really cool to watch in classrooms. So this next slide just gives you a little bit of a sampling of some of the texts that um, are in, um, utilized in each one of the uh, grade level programs. Um, and I imagine that um, many of these are gonna be familiar and some of them might not be as familiar. Um, there's definitely a few probably in each unit that teachers may not have known about, um, but you'll get to know them. And they almost become like old friends for you, for the kids in your classroom. Um, and there's a wide variety. There are um, certainly great pieces of literature, but a lot of nonfiction texts too, depending upon the unit of study. Um, also, when you get into first and second grade, not only are there books that serve as text, but there's a lot of other resources that become text for children. Um, everything from um, primary source documents, news articles, um, just even photographs that kids study and really um, dig deep into what they're seeing in a particular picture or photograph. So text takes on a much broader meaning than just a book. Something else you'll notice is that each one of the units in each program is organized around what we call an arc. And the arc is driven by um, a at least one guiding question, sometimes a couple of guiding questions, and then some big ideas. So it's always the goal that by the end of the unit, children have a pretty good grasp on those big ideas. That's what they're exploring. And those guiding questions drive the work every day. Teachers will always be coming back, bringing kids back to those guiding questions. And by the end of the unit, they'll be able to answer those guiding questions. So what you're seeing right now is coming from the first unit in K for Me that's called Our Community. And so you'll see that the guiding questions there are who and what makes a community and what does it mean to be part of a community? And then there are on the right-hand side, those big ideas that are associated with the questions. When Nicole, flips to the next slide, you're going to see how this progression happens because the uh, next slide is going to show the first grade. And so again, this unit, the theme is around community, but the question is shifting now. So it's taking it out a little bit bigger. This essential question is how do we build strong communities? So it's getting kids to, to build on what they've learned in pre-K and K about community and take it to the next step. And those big ideas are starting to broaden out more. And this same um, progression happens into second grade. We didn't give you that one, but it takes it out even a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Leanne. So way back in the beginning of our um, time today, I had shown you how pre-K for me has six units of study, and then that goes into K for me, which has four units, et cetera. Um, so the six units that exist in pre-K for me are here, um, and their sort of big ideas are tagged to them. So maybe this was a little out of order. I could have put it earlier, but regardless, you can see that um, in pre-K for me, students start off their, their school year with unit one, which is family. 
And then they move from there into friends, right? Two really big um, concepts that students and young children can really relate to, regardless of who their immediate family members are or who their closest friends might be. Um, these two units really build on the idea that there are people around us um, and that we get education and we get nurturing and we get relationships through them. So in unit one, we're really talking about that a family is a group of people who care for and support one another. And then that bleeds into unit two friends, where we're talking about how friends might have conflicts, they can ca cause complex feelings, and friends can work together to solve problems. And then from there, we get into our four um, more science-based units, still keeping the concepts of unit one and unit two going, right? Building off of the learning that has already happened in those other units. So we start to talk about wind and water, which personally in the state of Maine, I think is perfect timing because this typically is happening um, around these winter months where we're really seeing some of the water freeze. Um, we're, we're getting lots of different types of precipitation. Um, it's windy. Uh, the throughout the course of fall. So these concepts of wind and water really come in great time-wise for us. Um, but in this unit, students are looking at the properties of water and wind and how weather affects humans and animals. And then sure enough, end of winter comes spring, we're talking about the world of color. And so now they get to explore colors in their world and that how that colors can help us organize our world. Um, so this is a really great unit to look at how colors bleed, how colors um, stain, and they, they talk about laundry and, and the um, dramatic play center becomes all these really great, wonderful things. So unit four, the world of color students are really ready to take on some bigger concepts and bigger th higher order thinking skills. From there, we move into unit five, shadows and reflections, and then we end the year with unit seven, things that grow. Um, and in the things that grow, you know, this time of year, students tend to be outside more often, the weather is getting nicer, but we try and bring some of that indoors as well. So we talk about worms and composting worms, um, as well as plants and, and sprouts and flowers and things like that. Each of the units in pre-K for me last about four to five weeks. Um, so over the course of the school year, we're 35 weeks, we're right there. Um, there is time in between each unit for teachers to either play a little bit of catch up if there's been a snow day or if they've been out ill or what have you. There are buffer days for those purposes. We also encourage teachers to utilize that time in between units to do activities that they've done for years that they know and love. So even though during unit five shadows and reflections, we might not have a lesson to celebrate mothers for Mother's Day, that doesn't mean we can't still plant mums and talk about how they're growing and then bring them home to celebrate Mother's Day, right? So there's times and places throughout this course of the year where teachers can still do the activities um, and the crafts and, and whatnot and read the stories that they um, have always loved that may not be part of the curriculum. But these six units, and there's a typo that says unit seven, it should say unit six. Um, so that's lovely. Next, I'm going to shift us to, I think this is back to you, Leanne. That would be right. <laughs> okay, so in kindergarten, first grade, um, instead of six units, there's actually four. So the units become a little bit longer and that's intentional because children, um, as they're getting a little older, can sustain a bit longer and go a bit deeper with some of the, the various content and themes. Um, in both programs, unit one is about six weeks in length, and then the other units last about eight weeks. And that's also a little bit deliberate because we recognize that teachers need a couple of weeks in the beginning to do some routine building. And so it um, allows you to enter into that first unit a little bit more slowly, build some of those classroom routines, um, and then um, still have time for those other eight week units as the year progresses. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you see that progression in unit one across both programs is focusing on communities. Um, and then you'll notice that in um, the second unit, the focus is around animals. Um, in kinder, Garden, it is more about animals and the habitats in which they live, which students absolutely love um, in our state. And um, in first grade, it shifts to focusing more about how animals survive and thrive in the various environments and habitats in which they live. Um, 
Then the programs move on. Um, in kindergarten, the next unit is construction. I think that is probably one of the favorite units for children. Um, there's a lot of building happening across the classroom, a lot of um, thinking about how, not only how we construct, but why what we construct is so important for people, meeting people's basic needs. Um, and in, unit three of first grade, that construction unit from kindergarten kind of loops back a little bit again, um, but really thinking about how um, communities are able to provide the resources that are needed by um, people living within them. And so there's a lot of parallels that continue to get built. Um, in kindergarten, the year ends with our earth, which is again, a lot of kind of building on the pre-K um, end of uh, their year with growing, um, but also thinking about environments and how the way in which we act in our environment can help our earth or things that might not be so healthy and helpful to our earth. In first grade, the end of the year is um, a unit about light and sound. Um, and this is a really fun one for students too. Very, very engaging um, and taps back to some of the concepts that they explored originally back in pre-K actually. Um, the, um, oh, just lost my train of thought, what I was gonna say. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Um, oh, we'll come back. All right, it'll come back to me eventually. We can we can probably move along to call it's five. She'll be right back. She does it every day. Um, well, yep, there she is. Lee and I'm gonna put this into the chat box if you wanna go ahead and describe. Oh, where where you are, Nicole, sorry. Okay, um, yes, so um all of the instructional programs can be found on our um, department's website. They are um, housed in our early learning team's um, web pages. Uh, and when you go there, you'll be able to select the specific program. So Nicole's actually, I think, going to take us out into the website just to show us that really quickly. Um, all of the pieces to the program can be found here. Um, and you'll get a a bit of a feel for this in just a second um, as she starts to um, scroll through some of the programs. But um, we know that, you know, teachers approach their planning in different ways. So we have teachers who on a daily basis are really coming to the website and that's where they're getting all the content from, but they're doing it digitally. They might have it on their iPad or their computer. Others like to really take everything and print it out and have it in hard copy. So we try to produce it in a couple of different ways so that it's easy to print it out in its entirety if that's what your preference is or um, access it in an online platform. And everything's organized unit by unit. There are also um, a number of guiding documents that are available or sometimes termed supporting documents. Those are really important to helping with the overall um, understanding of the program. We walk through in our summer training a lot of the content of those introductory documents so that um, teachers are getting a good understanding of why the program is designed the way that it is. Um, and those are sort of the underpinning to each one of the units. Um, but then you can dig down unit by unit and um, see everything that you need. I don't know if, Nicole, you want to click on maybe into one of the units just so they can see how that unfolds. I think she's in first grade right now. And you can see how each week, everything that you need for that week is available. Each of these links is the lesson plan for that activity. But there's also a link, you can eventually go back to it, where if you wanted to pull it all down at once, you could do that. So you could do, yeah, yeah you could do the entire week in one big chunk. 
We also, for kindergarten and for first grade, we have uh, recorded unit overviews, which are really helpful. Um, our developer from Boston has helped us to construct those, and we're in the process of building those for the pre-K program as well. Um, we find that that can be really helpful, especially in the first year. You know, we, we provide training in the summertime, and we spend a lot of time really looking at unit one with a lot of the examples. Um, so by the time you get to unit two, it's nice to be able to go to something and actually just watch and have somebody explain, here's some of the big ideas that are going to unfold um, in that unit. And I know now what it was I was going to say about the, the units in kindergarten and first grade. Um, in both of those grade levels, there is a project um, experience that students are building up to in each unit. Um, it's something that they do collaboratively. Um, a lot of the work happens together as a classroom um, and decisions get made, but they're almost always either constructing something or um, solving a problem of some kind. So it's pulling together all the learning in a very productive way and applying it to either that problem or project that they're designing. Um, and those are pretty cool um, experiences for kids. And some of them, um, it's recommended that you seek out some broader audiences for, whether it's inviting families in to be able to see a showcase of the work that was constructed or inviting maybe some other grade levels in your school or um, the principal or the superintendent to maybe come and take a look um, so that students have an authentic audience to share with. Thanks for indulging me, Nicole. <laughs> no problem. Um, so while we're on the website, uh, Leanne had mentioned some of these other pieces that are available, and these are just some quick screenshots as well. Um, she mentioned the guiding and supporting documents, the pre-K for me and K for me is there. Um, I believe the first grade for me one is still being finalized. So I, I, to my knowledge, it has not been posted, but we'll get that up there as soon as it's um, complete and we get the go ahead to do that. Uh, each of the grades also offers a materials list, which includes a book list, and I'm going to flip to that in just a second. Um, it offers any of the visual aids for centers and protocols um, that are recommended for any of the units or any of the lesson plans. So, for example, the visual aids for centers in K4Me might include center signs, some gu printed guiding questions that teachers like to hang up around the room, um, a turns list, which we go into great detail during training, um, a visual for an I will be right back for students that are creating and need to step away from their project for a moment so that nobody else takes their spot, things like that. Um, teachers are welcome to create these on their own, but if they don't have the time or means to do that, then uh, those items are provided. Um, there's also some other things, for example, the thinking and there's thinking and feedback visuals that we support teachers in using, um, a letter that you can send home to families to collect beautiful stuff or basically recyclables, um, and some different icons that some that teachers like to use uh, for their stations. Again, these are optional, um, but if you don't want to recreate something and it already exists, then there it is. Uh, we also offer a suggested pacing guide. So the one that's shown here is for pre-K for me, and it shows how all six units might play out over the course of a school year. So if you look in September, the first few weeks are blank. There's no units or pre-K for me lessons happening. Like Leanne mentioned, this is really the time for teachers to get to know their students, um, for students to become comfortable in the environment and with your routines, et cetera. So there's lots of learning and lots of introductions happening during then, but we don't encourage teachers to dive into the first unit, week one, lesson one, until a few weeks in. So this particular pacing calendar shows uh, unit one starting September 18th, and it goes for the next four weeks. And then the blue is an extension week, and then there's that buffer week that I had mentioned earlier. And then we would start uh, unit two in yellow, move into unit three, et cetera. Um, we also have a blank one of these for teachers to use if they these dates don't correlate exactly to what they need. Um, so this can just be another great planning and visual tool for folks. 
Um, all of this is available on the websites for free. There's nothing about accessing these that comes with a cost. The only cost associated would be in purchasing the materials and the book list that's required to fully implement these programs. So I believe on my next slide, hold on. Okay, um, there's some QR codes here that will bring you to the materials and book lists and I'll leave these up for just a minute. But um, this is going to give you, so the pre-K for me one is actually a Google sheet, but the K for me and first grade for me ones are Excel sheets. And I just want to call out that on the bottom of the Excel sheets are additional tabs. So make sure you go through all of those. One might be specific to books, one might be specific to consumables, one might be specific to furniture, things like that. So arguably the furniture and materials are things that we likely already have. If they're not in the teacher's classroom, they might be available somewhere else in the school that we can grab them. Um, but some of it will need to be purchased or updated. So take a good look through what's there and see what types of things might need to be purchased or requested as donations, et cetera. Um, the books that are there, and I saw the question in the chat as well, some books, it is true, at least in pre-K for me, um, have gone out of print. So if and when that happens, um, the first thing we recommend is to reach out to your local library, see if that they have a copy of it. Now, it doesn't mean, obviously, that you can keep that copy, but it would give you access to understand what the content of that story is and why it's in the unit of study that it's in. If it can't be purchased or if the cost to purchase it is exuberant, then what we would suggest is either reaching out to us or we have a number of teacher leaders um, who are implementing these programs who are running into the exact same barriers. Um, and through those conversations, we can determine A, what they're doing to supplement a book that might be out of print and B, what we might suggest as a replacement text. Um, Pre-K for me has been a lot round in Maine for a lot longer than the other two grades. So it's certainly um, not impossible for us to, to look at it and look at what text are we saying these teachers need, what's the barrier to getting it and what might we suggest replacing it with. Um, so always reach out to us to, at our team um, and we'll make sure that we get, you know, to sort of chat about that and see what we might replace it with. And I'll just um, share too, when you're looking at the material lists for kindergarten and for first grade in those Excel spreadsheets, those spreadsheets were built on Boston's um, spreadsheets that they use when they're ordering materials. Um, so it, because they centrally order everything, they have certain publishers or um, companies that they work with and those you'll sort of notice are listed. It does not at all mean that that's where you need to purchase through. Uh, a lot of our schools choose to purchase things through other publishers, um, basically wherever you can get the best price or, or you know, that's what we want you to use. But um, it just didn't really make sense to completely redo everything. So um just keep that in mind when you're looking at the list. And we strongly encourage, you know, take a look at what you've already got because you probably have some of these books already and a lot of the materials. What you want to figure out are, are where you have those gaps. Um, okay. Is this me, Nicole? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So what, what we encourage um, folks who are considering um, stepping into the programs to do is spend some time really exploring at this time of the year. Um, go and look at our web pages and check out the programs. Um, you might also want to go to Boston's website. You'll see, you know, obviously their version of the program there, but they also have a lot of other resources that they've developed, some video clips where you can see um, children actually engaged in the programs. Um, and that can be really helpful, but you want to make sure that, you know, you're spending some time really getting your head around this and making sure that you're, you know, excited and ready to jump into it and that your administrators are going to be supportive of the work that you're doing. That's super important. Um, 
as you decide to adopt the program, um, there's definitely some supports that we can offer from our end. Um, the department for the last, oh, probably five years now at least, we have provided summer training for each one of the programs. Um, for pre-K, it's a two-day training. And for kindergarten and first grade, it's actually three days of training. We do the first one in June, shortly after school gets out. And the focus of that particular day is very much on um, what we refer to as the literacy block of the program. It's a one hour part of the, the day um, for the program, but there's a lot that happens. That's when the phonics program piece happens. It's when shared reading stations and small group instruction is taking place. And so um, we have found over time that if we sort of spend the day really working on that part together, it makes the next two days of training with the rest of the program um, run much more smoothly. And so those other two days happen later in the summer. Um, this year, we're taking the uh, week of July 29th through August 1st for those two-day trainings. So um, pre-K, it will depend on the number of pre-K teachers who need training, um, exactly whether we're gonna run two two-day sessions, or if um, we don't need that many, we'll just run one two-day session. Um, so where that's gonna happen and the exact dates for each of those will get determined um, over the next month or couple of months. For kindergarten and for first grade, we'll do kindergarten um, k for me training on July 29th and 30th, and we'll shift to grade one on July 31st and August 1st. And those trainings will happen either in Augusta or Waterville. Um, we'll make that decision once we figure out what's going to happen with pre-K um, so that we can organize our, our locations. Um, I do want to say, um, Nicole, can you just go back to the previous slide for one sec? Um, as you make the decision to adopt the programs, obviously one of those first steps that you're going to have to, to take is investing in those materials, locating the materials, pulling all of that together. I do really want to stress that for kindergarten and first grade, it's very important that you have a structured phonics program um, because that is a key part of the literacy block. That is not a piece that comes with the K for me or first grade for me program. Um, that is a piece that you may already have as a school, um, or if you don't have a phonics program, you will need to add that piece to it. We'll help you in the training to um, figure out how you marry that together with the rest of the components, um, but you do need to have that piece. And then um, as Nicole mentioned earlier, currently the kindergarten and first grade programs don't have a math program. Um, schools would use a standalone, their standalone math program. We are in the process of building a math program for kindergarten, first and second grade. Next year, we're gonna pilot that in a few classrooms around the state. So it will be available the following year for schools if they so choose. Um, it's not that you would, will absolutely need to use that program, but it will be an option once it becomes available. Okay. And I think we put a slide, the one right before this one, that is about um, just a direct link to Boston site because it is a very helpful bank of materials. And then I know on a couple slides before this, I think the link to the registration for summer training was included as well. I put that in the chat box as well. Yeah. Great. So I know we are actually five minutes over our scheduled time. Thank you for the grace um, and sticking with us. Um, totally understand if you need to go, but also very happy to stay on for a few more minutes for anyone who might have some questions that they would like to ask us. Um, and certainly available at any point after today to answer questions. <laughs>